I'd like to <clears throat> uh, encourage you this morning with a with a, a scripture from Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, it says, The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. And I have read that scripture most of my life, just taking it at face value. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. And, and recently, the Lord gave me a little insight into that scripture, so I'd like to share that with you. The spirit of man, the spirit of a man, the spirit of, of, of a man is the eternal part. You're made out of three parts. You have an eternal spirit. It's going to either spend eternity with God or apart from God. You've got a mind, a will, and an emotion. That's your soul. And you live in a body. And the body is subject to the spirit. In other words, without your spirit, your body will just die. But your spirit will live without your body forever. The spirit of man, so we're talking about the eternal part of the man, is the lamp of the Lord. Now, I've read that and read that and read that, and I thought, what? In, I'm just not quite getting the picture there, God. Help me with this. Searching all the inner depths of his heart. Well, there's another scripture that's like to, that, 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 that kind of complements it. And it was the scripture that I, I, I gave you just a few moments ago when we were in praise and worship. And it says in Psalm 18, verse 28, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Now, I've lived too much of my life in the dark. I'm not there now. But darkness is that place where you're like, what? I don't know what to do. I don't know why I'm feeling this way. I don't know exactly what's in front of me. But dear God, I need some help here. It says, for you, Lord, will light my lamp. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. And if you go back to where that first scripture, it says, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. You see, now this is the place where it began to get clear, when the Lord began to show me that if you'll take some time, if you'll actually say, God, and it don't have to be complicated, and you don't have to talk to him in, Old English, like King James does. He's, he's real. God, here I am. You know me. And I'm lost. I'm in the dark. Now, I live there a whole lot less. I mean, I still visit from once in a while. There's still things that I <laughs> ain't real close, crystal clear. But it's less and less, and I'm living more and more in the light. Because I meet him in my spirit. He talks to my eternal part of me. He benefits my mind, my will, and my emotions. He benefits my body, but he is talking to my spirit. He meets me there. That's where the match is struck and the candle is lit. That's where the illumination comes on. And that's where he says, look, let me explain something to you. And he lays it out. And I go, oh, 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 thank you. I've been tripping over that thing all my life, and all I needed was some light to see that there's something there in front of me. Now, I want you to get this, because this is important. When he strikes that match and he lights that candle, he uses the candle for a reason. Now, back in the, in the old times, you know, when this was written, they didn't have electric lights. They didn't have fluorescence. They didn't have LEDs. They had fire. So they would light a lamp. They trim their lamps. They oil their lamps. There was all kinds of structure that was for the candle, for the, for the illumination. But I think it's important that we not lose that it really was fire. We talked this morning about the Holy Spirit indwells us, and the Holy Spirit quickens, makes alive our mortal bodies. And part of that is right here. The spirit of man is the candle that God strikes the match and lights it, and that fire is red hot. It's God's love pursuing you. It's God's love, just like a candle, consuming you. And yet, it's the Holy Spirit that provides the wax, the oil, for the flame. So it's not costing you anything. And yet, it's a red-hot love God's giving just for you. That's a good word. God's God is so good. Anyway, that's good. Praise the Lord. Bring a Bible today. 
Say, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Say a word will set you free. Amen. All right, we're doing a part two on the lukewarm church. Uh, I'll give you a little review since we had Brian here last week. And as I said earlier, if uh, you were here and heard that message, you need to hear it again. And if you weren't here, you need to hear, hear it the first time, and then you need to hear it again at the first time. I told uh, the people last week, you ever touch an electric fence and felt that current flow through your body? Well, I felt like that the whole service last week. And the whole time he was preaching, it was awesome. It was anointed. I related to him coming to our church in biblical days. It would be like the Apostle Paul showing up. Actually, Brian has gone to more countries than the Apostle Paul did. If you think about it. And I don't think the Apostle Paul was healed of a fast-growing tumor either. So Brian's quite a fellow. All right, so we're, we're studying the book of Revelation from a positive viewpoint. Everybody say positive. Positive, positive viewpoint. And uh, we're in uh, the section here about the, the church of Laodicea. It was one of the seven churches that existed uh, during John's day. And I believe there's a type of these churches that exist today. Uh, they've been related to existing through church history. Well, we probably could go throughout the world and find churches that fall into these different categories even today. Uh, I know I was raised up in a different type of church than this church is. And I can tell you which one of those churches relate to that church. <laughs> so all of us were brought up in different kind of backgrounds probably. Now, all the letters include an appeal to hold fast and listen to what the Spirit's saying. I believe we're in a day that you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. So you can be in the right place at the right time every day doing the right thing. There is no excuse other than you to get in trouble. As far as being in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. No excuse for that. You're a born again believer. You got the spirit of God on the inside of you. You need to listen to that still small voice on the inside and not reason away his leadings when he gives them to you. Hear an amen, oh me, or move on, Pastor. All right. So we've got to hold fast and listen to what the Spirit's saying because the Holy Spirit's our guide and teacher in these last days. And each church listed in this uh, chapter is promised that everyone who conquers or everyone who overcomes will be rewarded by Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm an overcomer. Now, some days you don't feel like an overcomer. Some days it looks like you're being overcome. Right? But I'm not going to submit to that. I am who God says I am, and I have what God says I have, and I can stand at 4 o'clock in the afternoon with a black suit on and do what I got to do. Amen? Because God's grace is sufficient in my life. So it's time to take your authority in the earth and realize who you are, and you are a force to be reckoned with. And there's not any demon in hell or heaven or earth, well, not in heaven, but on earth or in hell that can stop you from doing what God's called you to do. If so, you'd never gotten saved. You definitely wouldn't have got filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? So say, I'm an overcomer. Now say it like you mean it. I'm an overcomer. So I guarantee you this week somebody's going to have an opportunity to overcome. Aren't you? You're going to have some opportunities. One thing you got to watch in life is dread. Oh, my goodness, did I dread Saturday. I mean, on Wednesday, I was like, gee, it's supposed to be 93 degrees on Saturday. And I thought, I'm not going to dread. I'm not going to dread. I'm not, I had to cast down dread. You know, you got to do that. 
you got to cast down dread because it'll it'll mess up your mind. Amen. You get to where you don't enjoy nothing. That's the whole thing of being harassed in your mind. I don't know where we're going with this, but it's good. <laughs> the whole thing of being harassed in your mind is to keep you from enjoying your life. You get a little pain in your body. Oh, my God, what's that? Oh, my God, what's that? I wonder what that is. Well, maybe you slept on your arm last night in the bed. <laughs> Amen? I've had days like that. I got up and I'm like, what's that? Well, I probably slept on it. Halfway through the day, you don't even pay attention to it. Amen? Gird up. Gird up your thinking. Get that stinking thinking out of your head. And think what God says you ought to be thinking. Good, pure, lovely things. Oh, it's going to be a beautiful wedding. It's going to be awesome food. I mean, we had the food at that wedding. Didn't we, Tom? I even saw people leaving with a lot of food. Especially cupcakes. A lot of people leaving with cupcakes. Woo! Say, I'm an overcomer. All right, so in Revelation chapter 3, do you have those scriptures today? Did I, did I get you informed? Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22 in the Amplified. So if you don't have an Amplified, just look on the wall. And to the angel, messenger of the assembly, the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the trusty and faithful and true witness, the origin and beginning and author of God's creation. Who we talking about is talking here. Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. I know your record of works. So what's the subject? Works. I know your record of works and what you're doing, and you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. What's he talking about? Works. He's not talking about your salvation here. Because it's really disturbing if you think in regard to your salvation, if you read the next verse. Because it says, so because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Well, thank God. God still loves lukewarm people. But it's not talking about lukewarm people here. It's talking about lukewarm works. But a lot of preachers use this verse and say Jesus is going to spit you out of his mouth, you slimy thing. <laughs> well, that's not what the scripture is talking about. What's it talking about? What's the subject? Works. works. And Jesus is saying, as a church, I'm not happy with your works. I'm not happy with your fruit. Now, the Bible says God is glorified when we bear, never say much fruit. Not a little bit of fruit, but much fruit. So I'm a bearer of much fruit. All right. So if you do that, you're pleasing to God. So the church is not being rebuked for its spiritual temperature, but the barrenness of its works. The church was providing neither refreshment for the spiritually weary nor healing for the spiritually sick. The church was ineffective, and this was distasteful to Jesus. Now, since we began Faith Alive Fellowship, I haven't visited a lot of other churches because I'm a little busy on Sunday. And Wednesday, and every other day of the week. So I don't get to other churches very much. But I've had visitors that have come to this church and said to me afterwards, I just want to thank you, Pastor, for this church. We visited other churches in this community, and no one would speak to us. Now, that just is mind-boggling to me as a pastor, that there would be a visitor in a church that nobody would speak to, now, I was at the garage one day with my mechanic, and we were talking. And he was talking about a new church in town. And he said, and those people aren't very friendly. They've never invited me to their church. Because they're kind of exclusive as to who they want in their church. Well, Jesus isn't. Right? Whosoever will may, may come. All right, so the door's open to whosoever will. Now, after they're here for a while, they might not like the flavor. That's what's so wonderful about life. There's so many flavors, right? So if they don't like this flavor, they can get down the street and find some other flavor, right? But I tell you, in these last days, you better find a church that's alive. 
One thing Patty likes to say to people on the phone when they want to know the name of the church, she says, faith alive, not dead. And they all laugh. Because believe it or not, there are some dead churches. You know, you've got to think sometimes we used to have the eagles. Ne- this is really different today. Uh, we, we used to have the eagles over next door here. And if you were part of that, I'm not putting any disdain on, on them as an organization. But they met on a regular basis. They uh, got together and ate. They had music. Right? They were an organization. And they had the spirit. But it was in a bottle. Right? So, when they walked out the door and we walked out the door, was there a difference in how we looked in regard to how they looked and how we talked in regard to how they talked and what we did in regard to what they did? Well, there should be. Should be. You should be a godly person. You should talk godly. You should act godly. Let me talk to this side. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. So some churches don't provide refreshing to people. A statement that was made one time is a church is not a trophy room, even though we do get up and testify. It's an emergency room. And when people come in hurting, we should be able to help them. You know, when Angie told me what she told me this morning, I thought, well, we need, we need to help Angie. She's having trouble breathing today. So we, we need to pray for her. We need to help her. So we've joined together first thing in the service and, and prayed for her today and believe in God with her. Amen? Believe in she'll make the right decision whatever she needs to do because we love her. Amen? And I love all of you. Well, I was waiting to see if anybody loved me. I just like, well, well, I put it out there. Uh, yeah, okay. But uh, we're commanded to love one another. And and that commandment is very important. Uh, love God and love people. And if you can't love people, it's because your love with God is not at the caliber it needs to be. The more in love you are with God, the easier it is to love people. And I've found that through experience. I mean, there's people that I don't like. But I love them. What? Yeah, there's people I don't like. I don't, I don't like their, their lifestyle. I don't like their conversation. I don't, there's a lot of things I don't like about them. But I love them in, in Jesus. And, and I would do whatever I could do for them. And we should do whatever we can do for one another. We all need help sometimes. Amen? And there's another thing of being sensitive to the Holy Spirit is if God brings somebody to your mind, we'll pray about that in a minute. I wonder why I thought about Fred and Anita today. I wonder why I thought about them. Well, I don't know why I thought about them, but I'm going to pray about it. And maybe I'm supposed to call them. Maybe I'm supposed to pray for them. You know, what am I supposed to do? Instead of going, well, hmm, I wonder why I thought about that. And just going about our day. If you ever think about me, I can tell you, number one, pray for me. <laughs> just, you don't even have to ask yourself any questions. Pastor Don, oh, well, I need to pray for Pastor Don because he said whenever that I thought of him to pray for him. And that'll, that'll, my wife and I can tell sometimes some days when things are going the way they go. And we can know people are praying for us because things smooth out. You know, life is not just a smooth road at times. There's some bumps in the road. You hit a pothole now and then. You know, I hit a pothole in Oklahoma one time, broke the drive shaft on my van. That was a big pothole. But the water was deep. I couldn't tell how deep it was. All right. So there were two cities close to Laodicea. One had hot spring water that they used for spas, for healing. The other had cold spring water that they used for refreshing. But like us, they tried to do what we try to do. They tried to bring the hot water to their city and they tried to bring the cold water to their city. And guess what happened when they both got there? They were lukewarm. They made aqueducts. They made piping systems to get the cool water from the mountains down to them, to get the hot water from the springs up to them. 
And when he got there, it was lukewarm. So when Jesus called them lukewarm, they knew exactly what he was talking about because they were living that every day. They didn't have the refreshing and they didn't have the healing. They were just lukewarm. Now, if we walked out here today and it had rained and there was a puddle of water there in the parking lot, would you sit down and sip it up with a straw? No, you'd say it's not fit for nothing, wouldn't you? Because you want it either cold or you want it hot. How many want a cold cup of coffee now and then? Well, not if you like hot coffee. Say, I'm an overcomer. Verse 17 says, for I say, for you say I'm rich. What does the United States of America say? We're rich people. You know, I've read you st statistics before that said if you have food in the refrigerator, if you have money in the bank, if and it goes down this whole list of things, you are one of the richest people in the world. And sometimes we forget about that. We forget about how blessed we are to live in the country that we live in. Now, we have a homeless problem. We have homeless veterans in our country. And that's political. That shouldn't be that way. That problem should be solved. You tell me why we want to send billions of dollars over to countries that want to kill us. And we got people homeless in our own country. It's time for change. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to start a revolution. Amen. Not just a spiritual revolution, but a political revolution. I, I sent a thing out on Facebook. Uh, I forget who that was written by. Some of you probably read it. Some smart person. <laughs> smart in economics. And he was talking about local government and national government, federal government. And he said, you know, federal government can be changed by people. The government represents the people. And it can be changed by people. But people need to rise up and change it. Anybody remember the Boston Tea Party? If they lived today, they'd look at us and go, what is the matter with you people? What is the matter with you people? You're being taxed at the gas pump. You think that price of gas is all for gas? No, you go online and find out how much of that is tax, federal tax, state tax, local tax. You go over to the food line and you buy something in the deli, you got a deli tax. You don't just pay the food tax, you pay a deli tax on top of that. So they're trying to tax and tax and tax and tax us so the government can get bigger and bigger and fatter and fatter and give our money to other countries. Oh, not be. It's time the people rise up and say, enough is enough. Hope the FBI don't show up at my house tomorrow. Okay. So he says, for you say I'm rich, I've prospered and grown wealthy, and I am in need of nothing. One thing Joyce Meyer is, has been teaching us in Ephesians is we are a self-sufficient people, especially as Americans. And we depend so much on what we can do. Where God is saying to us, I am your source, I am your help, I am your supply, depend on me. And one funny example she gave, she said she was out bowling one day and she wasn't bowling very well. And she said, well, you know, I, I really wish I could bowl better. And the Lord spoke to her and said, well, ask me to help you. And she said, well, I'd feel stupid asking God to help me improve my bowling game. He said, well, why not? She said she was working on her hair one day, trying to get her hair right. She's having trouble with her hair. And the Lord says, you want me to help you with your hair? Well, I'm a grown woman. I don't, I don't, shouldn't have to ask God to help me with my hair. But see, that's our independent spirit that we have. I can do it. She, what's, she said, what's a two-year-old say? I don't need any help. I can do it. She said, then you tell them, okay, go do it. And they come back crying, I can't do it. I can't do it. And that's what happens to us sometimes. We find out, I can't do it. So we need God's help. But many times God's help is the last resort, not the first thing that we go to he is a father and he loves you and he wants to help you i'm a father and i would do anything within reason that my children would ask me to do right that was godly and good for them right? but there again god won't do things for you that's bad for you oh god give me a million dollars you ever follow any of those people that want a million dollars most of them their lives were ruined by that 
Of course, we all know we could handle it. <laughs> there used to be a show on TV, didn't it? The million dollar, uh, uh, he'd go around and give people a million dollars, then they, that show would show what happened to it. it. Never was good as far as I remember. All right, Mark chapter 4, verse 19. But the cares of the world, say the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, deceitfulness of riches. What's deceitful about riches? Hmm? What's deceitful about riches? Think it's got power? I got money, I can, I can do anything. Well, the Bible does say that money answers all things. So it does have answers to things. But if the doctor lays down the bad report that you got Hukamonga 6, I don't care how much money you got. Right? Maybe 10. Hukamonga is 10. Let's go to 10. Incurable. You know, incurable. What you got's incurable. All right? What's all your money going to do now? Not going to do anything, is it? All right. Cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. Now, the desire for other things is not necessarily sinful things. How many of you like sports? Nobody likes sports? Just Jeff. Jeff. Okay. Jeff likes sports. All right. I don't, look, I don't care for sports. But I like science fiction. All right? And I like video gaming. All right? So you can get excessive in any area. You can like sports, but are you supposed to watch sports 24-7? Put God first. Then he doesn't care if you watch sports. Right? It's probably healthy for you to, to get involved. In sports. I know it's healthy for me to play video games. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how better I feel after I get on there for about an hour and I've killed people and I've blown up things and, <laughs> you know, I've sniped a few people. And, you know, it's just a wonderful feeling when I get done from that. Now, y'all going to laugh at me over that, I know. But I am who I am. And I sat down at a table with a young man at the wedding rehearsal dinner. Uh, I want to say he's eight or nine, I think. Eight or nine years old. I should know how old he is. Uh, I'd say eight, eight years old. And he plays video games. So I said to him, I said, what video game are you playing now? And he told me what he was playing. And I had just been at my son's the other week to watch a movie with him for Father's Day. And he was playing the same video game. And I was watching him play with a friend until we got ready to do our movie. So when he mentioned the name of the game and he was describing it, I went, oh, my son plays that game. He went, yeah. And I said, and a storm comes in, right, during the game. Yeah. And he just... We were just doing this back and forth. I was relating to an eight-year-old in regard to video games. And he was so excited. Because here he is at a reception after the rehearsal of all these adults that are sitting around doing all their talking. And who's he? He's an eight-year-old kid. And he's having something neat, but he's waiting for this to get over with. Probably shouldn't go home and play his video game. <laughs> but, but we connected with that. And it was just awesome to see him light up. When I showed him, I had a little bit of understanding of what he was talking about, even though I didn't play that particular game. So it's amazing how God will make divine appointments for us. If you like sports, he might bring you across the path of somebody that likes sports. And that might give you an opening, you know, to share with that person. So God's awesome, I'll tell you. God's awesome. But the cares of this world, deceitful of riches, desire for other things... Enter in and do what? Say, choke the word. Choke the word. Now, I had a garden one time when I lived down the river. And I was raised gardening with my parents. They had big gardens. They had a garden as big as this room. Okay, big garden. We had a potato patch down at my uncle's that was twice as big as this room. And we had a bean patch that was three times the size of this room. That had white half runners, and how many know what they do? They keep on growing, and they keep on growing, and they, you pick them, and then you pick them, and then you pick them, and then you pick them again, and then the last time you pick them, you pull the vines up as you pick them. Much fruit. I hated white half runners. 
I don't think I'd even eat them after, you know, it was over. But, but the garden that I had out on the river, even though I had all this knowledge of how to garden, I had me a tiller. I, I was good to go. I planted it. I had corn and I had beans and I had squash and I had, you know, all kinds of stuff. But I was busy. I was raising children. I was formulating the church. I, I was busy. So my garden got what? It got neglected and it got weedy. So if you neglect your spiritual life, listen to me. Well, I don't have time for the Bible today. Well, I don't have time to, to pray today. And then tomorrow, well, I don't have time today. Well, tomorrow, and then I don't have time today. And then next time, a week's gone by. And if you treat your natural garden that way after a week goes by, guess what? You walk out there and the weeds are higher than the other stuff. I had weeds climbing around my corn. All right? So that year I had what kind of harvest? Itty bitty. Everybody say itty bitty. Itty bitty harvest. I didn't have a very good harvest at all because I didn't attend to my garden. All right? So if you don't attend to your spiritual life, it's not on automatic. The weeds will come in and it'll choke out your life. And I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to people that don't come to church. They call this their church. If I met them out in the mall and they were with uh, somebody else in the mall and they introduced me, they'd say, this is my pastor. And I would look at them like, do I know you? No, I would know them. But I, but I tell them, you can't neglect the fellowship of the saints. That's just as important as reading the word. That's just as important as praying. That's all important because we are the body of Christ. Amen? And you're not the fungus on the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. You're supposed to be healthy. You're not a leech on the body of Christ. What's a leech? Sucks the blood of the life out of you. All right? So you haven't been put in the local church to be a leech either. To suck the life out. Oh, I just I just have all these needs. I just have all these needs. Well, we all do. We all have needs. And there are times that you might need help with your need. But come on. Week after week after week after week be needy. Gee. Let's learn some things. Let's grow up a little bit. I mean, I don't mind helping a two-year-old with some things. Right? But if he's 21... He ought to be doing a few things on his own. So I love the pastor. Okay. So the cares of the world, the seedful of riches, desire for other things, enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. This is even my message today, but anyway, we'll go with it. Therefore, <laughs> says, therefore, I counsel you to purchase from me gold refined, tested by fire, that you may be truly wealthy, white clothes to clothe you, to keep your to keep the shame of your nudity from being seen and salve to salve? Salve. salve. Why is it written there? Salve to put on your eyes that you may see. And we're not going to talk about that. Verse 19. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love. So in the, a few verses ahead, he said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And now what's he saying? those whom I tenderly and dearly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chasten, I discipline and instruct them. So when you read the word and you see something that goes ouch, then take it. Amen? Take it. Because God's trying to what? He's trying to improve your life. If the pastor get up and gets up and says something, you go, hmm, hmm. Right? Then think about that and maybe it's something you need to change. Something you need to improve in your life. You know, as Joyce again is teaching on Wednesday night, she said one of the responsibilities of a minister is to teach people how they ought to live. Well, you ought to live right. You ought to live godly. You ought to live holy. You ought to live so close to God that one day he just might say, Come on. It's like he did Enoch. Oh, I think of Enoch. I think, gee, what kind of a man was Enoch? Walked with God, and one day God took him alive. 
What kind of prophet was Elijah? He sent the limousine for him. Fiery chariot. You know, he sent the limousine for him to pick him up. I tell you, that's getting close, isn't it? And when we sing that song like we sang today, he didn't want heaven without us. I just, oh, gets me every time. All right. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chasten. I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic. Okay. Be enthusiastic and in earnest and burning with zeal. I ran into a man the other day at, at Walmart. He was security. And I knew him from years ago. He looked the same. He was just older like me. And we got talking, and we weren't two minutes into the conversation when we're talking about God. We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about end-time events. I tell you, I got goosebumps on me just standing there in Walmart talking with this man. That's the way it ought to be when people talk with you. They should all of a sudden be going, ooh, ooh, that, that's good, that's good. We talked faith. We talked the Bible. I looked at him when we were finished, and I had to go because I had places to be. He's just standing there. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. He was actually guarding a woman's life that the husband had attempted to burn her house down, and he threatened to kill her. So he's there guarding this woman. She worked at the bank there in the Walmart, and he's there as a, as a security guard guarding her. So when we got done, I looked at him, and I said, you know, you have been the highlight of my day today. He said, really? I said, yeah, you've been the highlight of my day. I tell you, people talk faith to you. That'll stir you up. Amen. 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 One of the opening phrases we use, and I, I want to discourage you from using this phrase. Okay? How you doing? Don't ask people that. You just open yourself up for a bag of hurt right there. Because they'll tell you. About 30 minutes later, you'll be standing there going, I wish I never asked that. <laughs> right? You tell them how you doing. I walked somewhere the other day, and, and I walked in, and the person said, oh, I had a doctor appointment. And I walked in, and they said, well, how are you today? I said, I am excellent. Well, they don't hear that every day. <laughs> right? So stand out. Stand out as a positive, God-believing, faith-inspired individual and help other people instead of, well, I'm not doing too good. That's why I'm here at the doctor office today. I just ain't doing too good. Gee, we got enough of them in the world. Be a positive person. Amen? This is really funny. Okay, verse 20. Behold, say behold. I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears and listens to and heeds my voice and opens the door. So whose job is it to open the door? My job. I will come into him and I will eat with him and he will eat with me. Well, what are we supposed to be eating? All of God's children are living, living. All of God's children love living bread. All of God's children love living, living. All of God's children love living bread. Throw up your hands. Fall on your face. The Holy Ghost is going to shake this place. Throw up your hands. Fall on your face. The Holy Ghost is going to shake this place. All of God's children love living, living. All of God's children love living bread. All of God's children love living, living. All of God's children love living bread. So what's the living bread? Word. word of God. You need to love the word. Say, I love the word. Love the word. You know, people, it, it, sit up and read your Bible like, well, pastor says read the Bible. Gee, you got to read the Bible. Well, let's see. Let's see where we go today. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Uh, and Judas went out and hung himself. Oh. <laughs> oh. Let's, let's find another one, Lord. Let's find another one, Lord. Let's find another one. Oh, give me another one, Lord. Oh, give me another one. Oh, what's another one, Lord? You whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Oh, Jesus. 
Don't read the Bible that way. Amen? Amen. Jesus is knocking at your door. Verse 21. He who overcomes, say that's me, that's me. is what? Victorious. Say I'm victorious. I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne. Man. As I myself overcame, was victorious, and sat down beside my father on his throne. He is able to hear, let him listen to, and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assemblies or the churches. Pew. I don't know what it does for you, but thinking of sitting in heaven on a throne beside of Jesus is just... That's mind-boggling, isn't it? But he says, he that overcomes, he's going to grant to do that. we got a long time for eternity. We all get a chance. Amen. Think about eternity. Be heavenly minded. But don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. You've got an assignment here in this life. And the assignment you have is to pass the faith test. And to be faithful. Amen. I'm going to lead you in confession. We did this two weeks ago, but it won't hurt you to say it again. And I still haven't gotten into the message yet that I had. But I hope you got something out today. I confess that I am a fountain of healing and a source of refreshment to everyone who comes into my life. When people come near me, they receive exactly what they need. Healing flows from me to everyone who needs a healing touch. I want you to just meditate on that a minute. You know, we, we talked this morning about the Holy Ghost is on the inside of us and he quickens our mortal body. Well, that's good. But he also wants to move outside of us and cause an anointing to flow through us to other people. That man I was visiting with in Walmart he loves to pray for people. And he lost one of his security jobs because he prayed for too many people. And then this new job he has, they told him, you can pray for people, but you can't lay hands on them. He said, Pastor, if I can't lay hands on them, I can't have an anointing transferred to their body. That man believes in this. Amen. Do you believe in this? Now, you can't lay empty hands on empty heads, all right? You've got to believe in this stuff, all right? Those who are spiritually tired, say that, become refreshed when they spend time with me. Okay. You don't need to drag anybody down. They're down. Lift some people up. They need to be lifted up, even children. Children are... I probably shouldn't say this, but I hate to be a child today. It's such a crazy, crazy world out there. I mean, I saw a little boy this morning as I was coming to church riding his bicycle up the street. Now, back in our day, there was nothing to see kids on their bicycles riding all over the community. Nothing ever happened to anybody. But I saw that little kid. I mean, he wasn't little. He was maybe eight or nine. And he's riding his bike up the street, and I don't see an adult anywhere, and I'm thinking, gee. It's a shame that I'm concerned for him being out there on his bike by himself. Isn't it? It's, it's just, ugh. okay. I allow no middle ground in my life. No neutrality. No lukewarm attitude. I am therefore continually filled with everything needed to meet the needs of people who come across my path. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your love for us. Oh, how you love us. You didn't want heaven without us, so you just sent Jesus to fulfill that plan that heaven could be ours one day. Well, you said, Father God, that we could have some heaven on earth right now. You said Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have it in abundance, full to the running over. We thank you for that promise. Father, I pray for this congregation of people today. They're a good bunch of people, Father, and you know that. And you know their heart. They wouldn't be here today if they didn't have a heart toward you. 
So I pray for them this week in regard to divine appointments they're going to have, Father God, that you will, by your spirit on the inside of them, give them a boldness, give them a clarity, give them an anointing, give them words to speak that will lift up the people that they're around that will bring refreshing into their lives. Let them, Father God, experience the living water that we experience each and every day in our lives. Help us to draw from that well that never runs dry. Hallelujah. And we give you all the glory and all the praise for everything that happens. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, raise one hand toward heaven. Say this with me. I am am. who God says I am. I have what God says I have. And I can do what God says I can do. Because God's grace is sufficient in my life every day. I'm in the right place at the right time every day doing the right thing. In Jesus' name, I am a blessing to everyone I come in contact with this week. In Jesus' name. Amen.